Hey everyone, Ronan here. I hope you guys are ready for this one. There's going to be a lot of things that happen in this one, and I promise you, the end will leave you guessing. But without any further ado, let's get into part 9. Our trio finally arrives on Milos Island. Paul comments that he thinks it's ridiculous they have to do this in order to get a gym battle. Ash does agree, but they are already here, so they should just find out what stopped the supply of revival herbs so they can get back to the mainland. Iris comments on how the weather here is horrible. She wonders if this is how it is all year long. Meanwhile, a voice that Paul has been ignoring in the back of his head is getting louder. It's getting to the point that he can no longer ignore it, while Ash is having the same feeling hearing the heartbeat of Reshiram. So, the group decides to split up to find the issue on the island, but before they can head out, they meet up with a young man who whose name is Lewis. He is a harvester of the revival herbs on the island, so our heroes decide he would be the best resource to get info from, so they join him in a guided tour. Lewis tells the group about the Battle of Legends, when the forces of nature, Thunderous and Tornadus, clashed on the island, bringing it to ruins. It went on for many years, until Landorus, at the behest of the people, pleaded with the two Jin to stop their path of destruction. Unfortunately, the plea fell on deaf ears, as Landorus was attacked as well. The humans saw no end in sight. If they didn't act, then their entire way of life would be lost. But how do you contain the literal embodiment of nature. After many attempts and failures, the humans turned to the Maiden of the Shrines on Milos Island. The inhabitants of the island pleaded with the Maiden of the Shrines. Eventually, she agreed to help, but warned if she went through with it, then this would only be a temporary solution. If successful, she could not guarantee how long her solution would last. The inhabitants didn't care. They were desperate, anything to save the lives of their people. With that, the Maiden proceeded with the sealing ritual, binding the rage of nature itself into three shrines on the island. Once the ritual had been completed, the Maiden warned, there must always be someone here to guard the shrines. If ever come the day that there is no longer a Shrine Maiden on Milos Island, the wrath of nature incarnate would be free and no one would be safe. With that warning, life on the island settled down. The clash of nature and the process to stop it faded into legend until the present day. Lewis ends the story with a statement. The island's last shrine maiden passed away recently and there is no successor to her. Paul says, so let me get this straight. You expect me to believe the whole production of the revival herb has been interrupted by a legend? Lewis tells him that he knows it sounds crazy, but after the shrine maiden passed, the herbs unexpectedly started to dry up. I think there has to be some sort of connection. Ash then asks somewhat of an obvious question question. Hey, Lewis, has anybody gone to check the shrines? Lewis responds with a no. He hadn't even thought about it. Ash then makes the suggestion to go and check it out. With that, the group sets out to the closest one, the Landers Shrine. Once they arrive, they find nothing wrong. The shrine is in pristine condition. It has been very well maintained over the years. Lewis tells him that the Shrine Maiden always made sure to perform upkeep on the shrines, especially the Landers one. Lewis then says that the Shrine Maiden once told him that if Landers was ever freed, it would be the most vengeful of the three Jin, as it was only sealed out of necessity. It actually fought on the side of man but we then betrayed it for our own selfish goals. With that, the group heads to the Tornado Shrine. What they find is a far different sight than at the Landorus Shrine. This one is in pieces. Someone smashed it. Lewis drops to his knees. He is in tears. Iris asks him what's wrong. Lewis says that the previous Shrine Maiden left him in charge of the shrines and their well-being. Now, something like this has happened. Paul tells him that it shouldn't be that big of a deal. It's not like he was charged with protecting it. Lewis, out of frustration, then yells at Paul. You don't understand. The previous Maiden was my grandmother. She was the one who charged me with this, and I have let her down. Paul now stares in stunned silence. Ash asks, well, why didn't Lewis just take over the duty of the Shrine Maiden. Lewis said he tried, but unfortunately, he was not born with the gift his grandmother had, to feel the aura of the Pokemon. You need that ability in order to make sure the forces of nature are sealed. The area immediately swirls as the wind becomes violent. In the sky above the group appears a Pokemon. Lewis, with fear in his voice, says, Tornadus. Ash says, well, I guess it wasn't a legend. The group has no time as Tornadus attacks. Out of fear of self-preservation, the group flees, with Tornadus giving chase. As our heroes run across the island, Lewis says that they are near the Thunderous Shrine. They need to get to it. Paul and Ash send out Electivire and Pikachu to attempt to push back Tornadus. As Electivire emerges, the storm above the island surges once again, and Paul hears it. Pikachu and Electivire are able to push back Tornadus, even though Electivire appears to be struggling to do so. The group then gets to the Thunder Shrine, and they are met with a set of familiar faces. Team Rocket. With barely enough time to yell no, Lewis watches as Team Rocket smashes the shrine. Above the island, in the sky, appears a Pokemon. Lewis exclaims, Thunderous. It roars with a loud cry, catching the attention of the other Jin, Tornadus. This is a moment of relief, as Pikachu and Electivire were starting to fail in holding it back. But this moment of reprieve is short-lived, as the Jin begin to battle, raging in the sky above the island. Lewis states, they are doomed. They have no hope to stop two legendary Pokemon. Meanwhile, Team Rocket have made their way to the last shrine on the island. Per the instruction of the boss, they were told to break all the shrines on the island and document their power, while he attended to other matters. Trying to mount a defense against the gym Pokemon, Ash sends out Ragnarola, thinking the rock type would be his best advantage against 
with them. Paul chooses to use Palpatode for extra support. Meanwhile, as Tornadus and Thunderous clash, the storm rages harder. Electivire finally succumbs to the stimulation of the storm, losing control of itself once again. Paul, in an attempt to control the situation, tries to recall Electivire, but the amount of energy surging through it overrides the command to return. This sends Electivire into a frenzy, attacking everything that moves. Paul tells Ash to go and handle the raging Pokemon and stop Team Rocket. He will deal with Electivire. Ash nods and heads out. Paul sends out Embor. He tells it and Palpatode to stand by for battle. Over with Iris and Lewis, Ash finally arrives to the scene of them fighting with Team Rocket, but ultimately, it's in vain. James smashes the final shrine, and then from it emerges the final Jin, Landorus. It glares intensely at everyone. Iris asks Lewis what they can do. Lewis, hopeful, tells her that in the past, Landorus helped the people of Milo Silent. Maybe if we plead with it, then it will help us again. Iris and Ash are game, but their pleas fall on deaf ears. Landorus, feeling betrayed by the humans, attacks relentlessly. Rock and Roland jumps in to protect Ash. The rock type is unable to push back the Jin of Lands. It catches a mud shot that hits it with enough force to leave a crater in the ground beneath it. Rock and Roll isn't moving, and Ash goes to see if it's okay, but Landris continues to attack, preventing Ash from checking his Pokemon. Ash then sends an Inferno. He tells it and Pikachu to distract Landris so he can get to Rock and Roll. The two manage to do so, and Ash gets to Rock and Roll. It's hurt. Bad. The damage it took was severe. Without immediate medical attention, it may not make. Lewis comes to Ash's side, and he hands him the last revival herb he has. He tells him to use it on Rock and Rolla. Ash does this, and the little Mon stands up, fully energized. It's ready for round two. Rock and Rolla joins Ash and his other two Pokemon in battle. They combined still are not enough, as now Tornadus and Thunderous have joined them in the fray. Back with Paul, he is struggling with his battle. It seems Electivire has been supercharged to a level that he hasn't seen before. Even with Palpatode's type advantage, it still can't deal with Electivire's raw power. This is just a testament to how well Paul trained it, but now he has to beat it. Enbor is no match for it. The Battle Pig, with Blaze activated, can barely stay Stave off Electivire, let alone beat it. Then Paul hears it. Paul thinks, wait, are you trying to reach out to me? Paul then feels it, the same feeling he felt from the day he arrived in Unova. Paul then calls, Zekrom, in a response. <laughs> Paul then tells Embor and Palpatode to stand down. He then approaches Electivire, throwing caution to the wind. The storm surges in the sky as Paul gets closer. Electivire heeds his assault as Paul inches closer toward it. Paul tells Electivire to be calm. He believes in it. Things have been intense, and Paul knows that if any one of his Pokemon can overcome it, then it's Electivire. This rings with Electivire. Suddenly, it comes to its senses, recognizing Paul. Then, the storm above starts to spark with lightning. It's like a car engine sputtering. From the sky, it descends a round, black orb, landing on the ground in front of Paul. Back with the rest of the group, Ash, Iris, and Lewis are struggling. They can't hold a candle to the power of the three legendary Jin. It's bad, as they are attacking each other as well as the group. The forces of nature don't care who is in their path. It will be decimated. It gets to the point that only Infernape and Pikachu are left standing. Ash thinks they need a power play. Then he hears it. Infernape looks back at Ash. This feeling is the same one they felt back in Castelia City. Ash opens his bag. The white stone is glowing. It levitates from the bag, heading toward Infernape, which is again enveloped in light. This spectacle grabs the attention of the battling legendaries. Now, their sole focus is on Ash and Infernape as it emerges from the light with a fusion flare, driving both Thunderous and Tornadus into the ground. Landorus just barely gets out of the way in time, but it now is only focusing on Infernape as it can feel the presence of Reshram, who it knows has more power than it. Infernape wastes no time going on the offensive at Ash's orders. Ash knows that this power is only temporary, so Infernape needs to end this battle now. With Pikachu and Rock and Rolla providing support, Infernape is able to take down Tornadus rather easily when the three combine their attacks, catching it off guard, knocking it out. But that leaves Thunderous and Landorus. The two have seen the teamwork of Ash and his Pokemon and are now on the defensive as not to meet the same fate. Thunderous and Landorus work on splitting up the trio to much success. With Landorus taking on Infernape in a one-on-one, -on -one, it can tell that Infernape is reaching its limit. The harder it's forced to battle, the faster the transformation burns through its power. As for Thunderous, it's proving to be too much for Pikachu and Rock and Roll. The two are easily being overpowered by the legendary, and to further complicate things, Ash's attention is being pulled in two different directions. This causes him to make mistakes when giving commands. This results in Pikachu getting caught up in an attack from Thunderous. Rock and Roll jumps in to try and help, but it's not enough to push 
back the power the two are facing. Ash calling on Ragnarola to hold steady reaches the little ball of rock and it responds with an intense glow. It captures the attention of the battlefield with its evolution into Boldor. This brief distraction is what Ash needed as he orders Infernape to grab Landorus and to use a fusion flare on it with everything it has. When the dust settles, Landorus lays in defeat, but Infernape has lost the transformation as well as its ability to fight. As Thunderous begins to launch a thunder to establish itself as the last remaining Jin standing, it is interrupted by a thunder from another. Ash looks back and there stands Paul and Electivire. Thunderous does not fear this inferior electric Pokemon and goes on the offensive, but Paul and Electivire won't be bested by the Jin again. As the two battle, Ash can hear the heartbeat of Reshiram reaching out to him, pulsating. What Ash doesn't know is that Paul can feel the same thing. The battle is coming to a close with Electivire being able to outlast Thunderous in endurance after taking a focus blast and countering with its own thunder punch that puts down the last of the Jins. With all three legendary Pokemon laid out across the island, the storm has now dissipated and the sun shines down. Then, almost to demonstrate the the cycle of life, revival herbs begin to sprout all over the island, reviving the trio in the process. But when the Jin regain consciousness, it seems they have calmed, as if they've gained respect for Paul and Ash for their efforts against them. With that, they head off into the world, now free for the first time in many generations. The group doesn't know what just happened. Things were so dire, now everything is so calm. Lewis is really worried with the freedom of the weather trio. Now the world has to be ready. Who knows what kind of impact they will have. Meanwhile, Team Rocket has made their way off of the island to meet up with Giovanni. The footage they have provided him with these three new weapons has him ready to move on to the next stages of Operation Tempest. Back with the group, Ash, Paul, and Iris prepare to depart from Milos Island. Before they leave, Lewis gives the group a small amount of the newly harvested revival herbs as a thank you for the work they did. He tells them to inform Clay that there will be a new shipment of revival herbs within the week. Paul says good, now they can get on with their gym battles. With that, the group departs back to Driftvale City. On the way back, Ash asks Paul how he was able to calm down Electivar. Paul begins to tell them about the stone that came down from the sky, but he stops himself, claiming that Electivire came to its senses and then they were able to help them in the battle. Paul has decided to keep the Black Stone a secret from his friends for now, as he is unsure if it is a power he can control, as he does not yet understand it. The next day, the group is at the gym for Ash and Paul's battle. Ash has elected to go first in this battle, as Paul seems to have his attention divided. Clay, the gym leader, greets the duo and is excited for a battle. Words of their exploits on Milos Island have spread to Drifel, and Clay wants a chance to battle with the trainers who would battle on par with with the legendary Pokemon. Ash is more than happy to take on this challenge and the battle gets started. Clay leads with a Pokemon Ash has never seen before, Golette. After using his Pokedex, he learns that it is a ground ghost type. Ash decides to go with Crocorok. He figures maybe it would want to test its strength against another ground type. And Ash is right, but of course, Crocorok won't listen to him. Every command Ash gives it is ignored. In the end though, Crocorok eventually wins, giving Ash an early lead after Crocorok lands a crunch on Golette, knocking it out. Clay then decides to go with his Palpatoke. Crocorok wants to battle this mon as well, but Ash calls it to try and get some control back over the battle. He then sends in his Duat. The otter Pokemon is itching to battle. Remember, Ash swore an oath to help it get stronger. So, it readies its scallops, taking its battle position. Clay orders Palpito to use Water Pulse. Duat is easily able to deflect this, but this was just to draw the attention of Duat as Palpito is able to get in close and use a supersonic on it. This proves to be the downfall of Duat, as it cannot get past the confusion and Palpito just picks it apart one move at a time. Ash eventually recalls it to avoid any serious damage to it or fitting the round. Clay tells Ash that he thought he would put up more of a fight. Ash then chooses to send in his newest evolved mon, Boldor. Clay says that's a dumb move due to the type disadvantage, but Ash tells him type isn't everything. Eventually, Ash proves himself right. Boldor was able to land a stone edge with a critical hit right after Palpatode was hit with a rock blast. With Clay down to his final Pokemon, he sends in his prized Excadrill. Ash is hoping to end the battle with Boldor, as his only Pokemon left is Crocroak, and he doesn't have the greatest faith in its ability to carry him to a win. Though Boldor is strong and it puts up a decent fight, the battle with Palpito did take a toll on Boldor, and it falls to a drill run. Ash, a little shaken, recalls Boldor. He holds Crocroak's ball in his hand. With reluctance, he sends back in Crocroak. The Sand Croc tries to assert its dominance as a ground type by intimidating Excadrill, but the Steel ground type won't have any of it. This throws Crocroak off, as it's never stared down an opponent that wouldn't flinch at its glare. Ash tells it that they need to work together or it won't win this battle, but the Croc blows it off just thinking he can do it alone like he's done in all of the other battles. It quickly becomes clear that Excadrill is far ahead in terms 
terms of power and speed. Ash tries to reason with Kokoro that if they work together, then they can win, but it again ignores it and muscles forward, ending with the same result. Ash thinks he has no chance and attempts to recall Kokoro to forfeit the battle, but it refuses to return. It won't accept defeat. Out of pure frustration, it forces its own evolution, glowing intensely as it changes into the much more powerful Crocodile. This unexpected evolution catches everyone off guard, and the new Mon starts to attack with no orders from Ash. Clay and Exodrill try to mount a defense against the hostility of Crocodile, but it's to no avail, and Exodrill falls in the battle. This does earn Ash the Quake Badge, but he doesn't feel good about it, as now Crocodile is rampaging through Clay's gym, celebrating its win. Eventually, it calms down, and Ash is able to recall it. Clay then presents Ash with his new badge. Ash does take it, but with reverence, as he doesn't like the way he earned it. Ash then tells Clay if he enjoyed battling with him, then his battle with Paul will be one that he never forgets. Clay looks at Paul with a deep silence. Later on at the Pokemon Center, Paul is strategizing for his battle with Clay. He and his Pokemon are all out on the battlefield, but his attention is still divided. He now has the potential to have the same power as Ash and Infernape, but he doesn't know how to access it. Paul's inner thoughts are at war with one another. On the one hand, he's been secretly wanting something that could level the playing field between him and Ash, but on the other hand, he's never been one to wait around for something to fall on his lap. He's always pushed to the next level of power on his own. Paul eventually decides that he needs to trust his own instincts, focusing on how he can use his Pokemon and not what they don't have. This should be an easy task for him, as he has seen Clay's battle style, as well as three of his Pokemon. Paul works into the night at the request to not be disturbed by Ash or Iris. This is fine, as Ash now has his own problems to deal with. He made the mistake of letting all of his Pokemon out of the ball to let them get some fresh air. He wanted to thank Crocodile for winning the gym badge today and congratulate it on evolving, but when Ash approaches it without warning, it lashes out at him with a dragon claw. Luckily, Infernape is able to intercept it with close combat and knocking the croc back. This puts Crocodile in its place for now, but little does Ash and Infernape realize the sand monster now has a vendetta against Inferno, and it plans to be a problem whenever it can. The next day, the trio head to the gym. Paul is quiet the whole walk there, very reserved. Iris asks Ash if he has any idea what Paul is planning to do in his battle. Ash just shrugs. He doesn't have a clue. Paul turns to them to say something, but he just smiles as they head into the gym. Clay greets Paul and tells him that he's been very anxious for their battle ever since Ash hyped him up. Paul tells Clay, don't worry, I plan to make this a good battle for you. With that, the two trainers take their positions. Clay starts the battle with his first Pokemon, Stunfisk. Paul figured Clay might use something that he hadn't seen yet, so he throws his ball. Palpatode. Stand by for battle. Paul's plan is simple. This one is a hard counter to anything Clay has, allowing Paul to fill out Clay's strategy even more. If there's any difference in the way he battled with Ash, then he will know here. Clay tells Paul that he thought he might try something like that, but it won't matter as he orders a mud bomb. The battle as a whole is one that Paul easily makes his way through. Clay is way too head on in his battle. Style. Paul easily counters everything that Clay does when he uses Palpatine's Muddy Water as a counter shield, just like his days back in Sinnoh against Ash, allowing him to take the win easily. Clay recalls his Stunfisk, verbally expressing his displeasure at the style of battling that Paul is using. Clay wants a head-to-head, -head, like the battle he had against Ash. Paul tells Clay he's a little disappointed. As a gym leader, he expected more. Clay responds with a simple, what? Paul says that since he came to Unova, every gym leader he's faced has proven to be somewhat of a challenge for him, but after watching his battle with Ash, Paul felt like this battle was going to be a simple one. This remark makes Clay angry. He says, okay, if you're disappointed, well then you're in for a rude awakening, as he sends in his next Pokemon, Palpatode. Paul just stands there quiet. Clay starts the battle by calling for an Aqua Ring so he can prolong the battle. Clay then orders his Mon into battle, but the tactic is the same brute strength. Paul orders his Palpatode to put up the counter shield, blocking the attack. This repeats for a while, but what Clay is trying to do quickly becomes apparent as Paul's Palpatode starts to tire, while Clay is still in relatively good health. Then Clay makes his Hail Mary play as he calls for a Power Oil. Paul expected something like this and recalls Palpatode, barely dodging the attack. Clay tells Paul that was a cowardly move. Paul tells Clay that he had a feeling that he had something like that up his sleeve, and all he had to do was wait. Now your Palpatode is starting to wear down. Though the Aquarine has been in effect, its stamina is starting to falter. With that, Paul sends in his next Pokemon, Torterra. Clay, having never fought a Torterra, is unsure how to approach it, so he does the only thing he knows how, head on. But again, Paul is ahead of Clay, putting up its Stone Edge defense, catching Palpatode in it with a critical hit. But this is still not enough to drop. Palpatode. The Tongue Toad is still standing, and it, like its trainer, is starting to feel the frustration of the battle. Palpatode uses this frustration to force its evolution into the much more powerful Seismitoad. Clay thinks that this is his chance. He orders his newly evolved Mon to get in close and to use a move that it learned upon evolution, Drain Punch. Paul orders another Stone Edge defense, but Seismitoad's new power is able to break through the defense and connect, draining Torterra's energy. Paul was hoping for this as he calls for a Giga Drain, countering the effects of the Drain Punch, as it's also a grass move that's four times effective against the water crown type, knocking it out. 
Clay recalls Seismitoad. He tells Paul that he wasn't expecting that. Even though he doesn't agree with Paul's battle style, he can respect it. Paul tells Clay even though the battle started slow, he's actually starting to enjoy himself now. Clay declares that he's not out of it yet as he sends in his final Pokemon, Crocoros. This Crocroak is far different from the one possessed by Ash. It's in perfect sync with Clay. Paul knows that this could be a problem as he hasn't actually gotten a chance to see Ash's at full power due to the two being at odds all the time. Paul then recalls Torterra and sends back in Palpatoad. As the battle starts, Paul realizes that this thing is fast. Palpatoad is too tired to continuously dodge the attacks. As a result, Palpatoad falls, only getting in one muddy water hit. Paul recalls it. Now that he knows what he's dealing with, it's time for him to call out his trump card. Paul throws his final ball as he declares, stand by for battle. From it, Weavile emerges. Iris wonders what kind of Pokemon that is. Ash tells her that it's one of the Pokemon that Paul left back in Sinnoh. He must have felt that he needed it as an ace for today's battle. Iris wonders why Paul never called on his other Pokemon before. Ash smiles. This is Paul. The true Paul. Paul, the tactician, that plans for anything. To Ash, this only means one thing. Paul is fully back, which means their adventures in Unova just got a whole lot more interesting. Back in the battle, Paul quickly takes control. Weavile's speed is enough to match Crocroak, and with a priority move Ice Shard, Paul quickly puts down Clay's final Pokemon faster than the first two. Clay recalls Crocroak, presenting Paul with the Quake Badge. Paul thanks Clay for the badge. He then takes his leave. Iris and Ash rush to follow. That night at the Pokemon Center, Ash tells Paul that he's impressed with today's battle. Paul tells Ash that it's the first gym battle he's had in a while where he felt like himself. Iris tells Paul that she didn't realize how much of a tactful battler he was. Paul tells Iris that's his normal battle style. The, the problem I realized for a while is I was trying to battle too much like Ash, and it wasn't working. It was confusing my Pokemon, causing doubt in myself. Ash says he can relate. When he first met Paul, he went through something like that when he battled Rorik back in the Orbrick gym. It took him a while to get past it, but once he did, he grew as a trainer. In a rare occurrence, Paul actually thanks Ash for staying by him, as he may not have been able to find himself again. Ash just smiles as the trio plan their next move, but in the back of his mind, Paul is still hiding a secret. The next morning, the group head out in the direction of Mr. Alton City and the site of the next gym. After three days of traveling, the group arrives at the final barrier before the gym, Charged Stone Cave. The group enters the electric cave. Right away, things seem off. The Pokemon are running in fear at the sight of our heroes. Iris yells, I know Paul's intimidating, but he's really a nice guy. Paul just gives Iris a stern look, though he does acknowledge that something isn't right, but they need to get through the cave as Mr. Alton City is on the other side. So, the group continues on. Meanwhile, deeper in the cave, Team Plasma Grunts are frantically searching for something. Oh, at the helm of this operation is Colorus. They have machines set up throughout the cave, hooked up to what it looks like the actual cave itself. It appears they are siphoning off energy from the cave. As a result, the Pokemon are becoming enraged as their habitat is being disrupted. You can tell that the Pokemon tried to fight back, but they are quickly dealt with by Colorus and the Team Plasma Grunts. Colorus tells the Grunts that they need to gather all the energy in this place. It is needed to power the containment field. Little do they know, there is an un welcome guest among them. Giovanni has made his way to the cave. You see, while Jesse, James, and Meowth were on Milos Island freeing the forces of nature, he had gained intel that Team Plasma was here. He aims to dish out some payback for their interference back in Castelia City. As Giovanni looks on from a distance, a small Pokemon pops out of the ground at its feet. Doug Trio. Giovanni has been using it to run interference to slow down Team Plasma by damaging their equipment. Giovanni is now ready to make his move. He aims to capture Culverus and convince him that it would be in his best interest to work for Team Team Rocket. Giovanni then pushes a button on a detonator to prime some explosives that he had set all around the cave with a timer of 5 minutes till they blow. With Dugtrio and now Golem by his side, Giovanni confronts Culrus with his proposition. Culrus was actually fully aware Giovanni was here in the cave. Even though he thought he was harming their operations, Giovanni was actually doing nothing of relevance. Giovanni, agitated, is not one to be bested and always has a plan B. Jesse, James, and Meowth have made their way to the cave and are lying in wait for their orders. As Giovanni and Colorus continue their friendly chat, they are interrupted by an alarm. Ash, Paul, and Iris have made it to the camp of Team Plasma. One of the grunts sounded the alarm, warning everyone of their arrival. Giovanni, less than thrilled that he is again is interrupted by those annoying kid, chooses to take care of this problem himself, as the charges he set start to tick down to their final minute. Colorus uses this distraction to make his escape, giving the command to abandon their mission to the Team Plasma grunts. Giovanni makes his way to our heroes, giving the command to Jesse, James, and Meowth to make their move. Over with Iris 
as Paul and Ash, they have all split up in an attempt to clear out any Team Plasma grunts, remembering that N told them not to trust any of them. While Ash and Iris are heading in a less than dangerous direction, Paul gets the pleasure of being the first to encounter Giovanni. Giovanni confronts the boy, voicing his displeasure that he is here. Paul doesn't really care what Giovanni has to say, but he does have a question. This piques Giovanni's interest. Paul says, I once heard a rumor that the gym in Viridian City was under the control of Team Rocket. Is that true? Giovanni, now very curious, says, yes, but that was a lifetime ago. Why do you ask? Paul then asks if that would mean Giovanni was its leader. Giovanni again says yes, but again, why does it matter? Paul then tells Giovanni that he once beat that gym and earned the Earth Badge, but Giovanni was not the person he beat. Giovanni tells Paul that's probably because after the gym was exposed, he gave up his operations there. Paul says he figured that, but he also heard the gym leader was undefeated until this happened. Is that true? Giovanni says, my boy, for someone who I aim to cause harm to, you certainly have a lot of questions. Paul states, just answer the question, are you that gym leader? Giovanni, now a little intrigued, proclaims that he is. Paul, with a smile on his face, says good, as he holds up a Pokeball. I won a battle, he declares, right here, right now. Giovanni tells Paul he's got guts, especially with what's going on right now. As the explosions start in the cave, and they are getting closer to him, Paul says, you already have a Pokemon out, pointing to Golem. What's stopping you? Giovanni thinks for a second, okay, I'll entertain you, but if I win, then you won't be leaving here with any of your Pokemon. Paul tells Giovanni he won't be winning, as he declares, Electivire, stand by for battle. <laughs> And that's all we have for part 9 of What If Ash and Paul Travel to Unova. How do you guys feel about this one? How do you feel that Ash and Infernape are getting closer to using the power of Rush Ram on a regular basis? And how do you feel about Paul keeping Zekrom a secret from them? And lastly, do you think that Paul and Electivire will be able to attain the same kind of power that Ash and Infernape have? Let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed the video, please drop a like for the YouTube algorithm. Also, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to interact more with me, don't forget to join the Discord and follow me on Twitter. And if you want to support me any further, head over to my Patreon. Just $5 a month gets you one week early access to all of my videos. These awesome people have already donated, so I can continue to bring you the content that you love. The links for all of these are in the description below. Anyway, I'm Ronan Charizard, and I'll see you in the next video.